Welcome back to Inspired Forward. I'm Dan Trinidad, and I am very excited for you guys to meet Steve Moy. Uh, Steve is, has been uh, in our business since 1996. He's helped 3,000 people purchase and refi homes. Um, he's a citywide home loans. He's down in San Diego, California, and I'm excited. Welcome, Steve. Hey, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Oh, you bet. You bet. So, um, we had a brief conversation before we, we started recording. Um, you got in the business uh, just in time. <laughs> You've seen three meltdowns and you're still scanning and to close 3,000 loans during this time frame is, is pretty remarkable. Um, maybe share with us a little bit of how you got into this industry and um, you know, how, really how it progressed. Okay, well, um, I was uh, my I was on track to be a high school history teacher, and I paid my way through college because I was in a band. And one of the guys in the uh, band ended up uh, moving up to Orange County uh, to get into a uh, uh, the mortgage business, doing 125 and Title One loans. And uh, it turns out that an, another guy that happened to be in that band went to work for him and decided to open a branch down in San Diego to be closer to his kid. And when I found out how much money they were making, I was working at a grocery store, working a 5 p.m. to 2 a.m. shift. And I was like, I could do that. Because at the time, the grocery store we were working at had this promotion called, you know, to, to just one more, like to encourage people to buy one items. And now this was during the uh, kind of the, the, uh, 91 recession but i had no trouble talking people into four dollar bottles of gourmet ketchup and i figured if i could sell gourmet if i could talk people into a gourmet ketchup during a recession then i certainly could um <laughs> help people with loans and homes and stuff like that but um uh what was interesting was um the guy who was my direct manager saw my potential. I had no sales background. There was nothing in my resume that would have said I would have been successful. But I under, because I had worked at a grocery store for so long, I understood who my clients were just because I was seeing them every day. And, um, in, and I outworked everybody. And in my first full year, I was the number two guy in the company. And the joke was that we went from Ralph's to Rich's because I was working for Ralph's grocery store. And then, you know, um, I had tripled my I actually quadrupled my income my first full year, but just it was just because I worked hard, I learned my products, and I knew who my borrowers were. How did how, you get trained? Uh, my uh, branch manager, uh, Danny Shaheen, shout out to him, still a great mentor. He uh, just did just a really tremendous, he came from an auto sales background, and he just did a really good job training, and then I would read uh, guidelines, rate sheets, ask questions, um, and just was uh, relentless in terms of, uh, you know, trying, uh, trying to help my clients and, and working a deal. That's pretty remarkable. So, so, you know, I've got several brand new loan officers and I'm, uh, you know, struggling a little bit with you know, how to get them ramped up. We're in, a, we're in a very good market. They don't have databases. We're having them call, you know, people in our company database and they're having some success. But what was your first step into going out and getting business or, or were you... Uh, at, the, at the time they were doing um, direct mail. Okay. And so that was good. But it's interesting that you say about the new loan officers because I give you credit for that because one of the, um, you know, you know, it's been a concern that the, you know, the average age of the loan officer is getting older, but the home buying public is getting younger. Right. And, but because of, and I think part of it is because numbers are public, like if you take someone on and you get lightning in a bottle um, and maybe, you know, in a, like there's a guy that I brought into the business. Um, we don't work together anymore, but I still mentor him. You know, within a year and a half, he was doing, you know, 15 million a year. So immediately re recruiters see his numbers and, you know, Hey, we'll make you a branch manager. Well, fortunately he's self-aware enough to know that he's not ready for that, but there's a lot of, you know, because numbers are public, you don't get the 
the benefit of being able to train people in kind of a vacuum in an incubator and grow them. And it's, you know, in the old days, you know, you would have companies that could invest in building younger people, but now, you know, because our margins are so compressed, it's like, we don't have the, the luxury of really training people and even identifying the people, you know, like you go to Nordstrom's and someone's selling you shoes and you're like, that guy, if that guy were selling loans, he'd be great. Mm -hmm. But we don't have the, most people don't have the luxury to, to, or infrastructure to bring those people in. So I give you credit for, for doing that. Well, um, it's, been, it's been a lot, of, it's been a challenge, but it's been very rewarding too. I really enjoy, you know, the stage of my career of getting, I mean, the key is in the, in the hiring, right? It's like what you said, it's getting the people that uh, are truly driven and, uh, you know, basically teach them the, the foundation, but, but let them go. And then the second key is figuring out a way to retain them because like you said, um, you know, everybody's, uh, everybody's contacting them. I, I'm, I'm fortunate in that our top producer is my wife and uh, she's not leaving anywhere. So as long as I, yeah, that would, that would be an awkward conversation if she did. <laughs> well, it's funny. You'd be surprised on how many people when, when these recruiters that call her and she said, well, I'm married to the, to the president. And they said, well, are you happily married? <laughs> so, I mean, well, you know, the thing though is, is that in your case, it wouldn't necessarily be bad to have her talk to people because at least you could, it's a good way of knowing yeah. like, like what's out there. Like, I'm not against, uh, you know, I think, um, uh, you know, I think that if I'm in a business where I have to cold call or get semi warm conversations, I'm not going to, um, you know, I'm always going to be open to having that conversation because I think it's unfair for me to want a uh, receptive phone conversation when I'm making the outbound call and, and not be receptive. I just ask, you know, I'll, I'll talk with anybody. I just won't have certain conversations during my work hours. Now, sadly, or gladly, because I love working, I'm working 12 hours a day, so I don't have a lot of, necessarily have a lot of time for those conversations, but I don't inherently think that's bad. You know, I think, um, you know, my son was asking like, you know, what is it you do? Because it looks like you're on the internet or you're having coffee conversations all day. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm selling. And he's like, uh, you know, he would, he thought about sales, but he's like, I'm not sure. And I said, it's not that people don't like salesmen. It's people don't like bad salesmen. Right. And, you know, the example that I'll give is um, he had to buy some dress shoes and we went to Macy's because I had a coupon and I'm cheap and all this stuff. But, you know, sometimes you'll go there and, you know, they have to go and get the other shoe in the back and it's kind of a long drawn out process. And then, um, so, he finally, uh, he found some shoes, but the register broke and he would have had to go to uh, buy them in the women's lingerie department. Now, um, with, you know, with a you know, massive amount of social media and stuff like that, that just wasn't, he wasn't going to take that risk. And I understood. So we went to Nordstrom's and of course the experience was just good. They've honored the coupon, you know, they was just a great, and I, I said, that's kind of the difference, you know, the, the, the experience that you're giving as far as in the hands of a, you know, it, what we do in terms of helping people find the right loan, be excited about um, the wealth benefits of buying a house and stuff like that. It's, it's a privilege and it's an honor, but also, um, you know, to be able to, uh, you know, to be able to do that well is a, is a, or even semi well is, is a, is a great, you know, it's a, it's a great important thing to be able to do and to be able to teach. And I think, um, I think the biggest thing that I always tell younger loan officers is that the minute you started thinking of Mr. Smith as Mr. 6,500, you're in the wrong business because you, you have to, it's, it's not, you know, the, the commission It's make, make friends, not profits, because if you do that, then the business will come because you don't want to be thinking of your, your clients as a number. You want to be able to drive through the neighborhoods and say, I help those people, or I help those people, or well, the landscaping on the equity line that we did is, uh, you know, paid for. That looks yeah, really all, good. All about all about building building long term relationships. So, so what's your mix of business? Purchase, refi. Um, I'm about I'm eighty percent um, purchase and twenty percent refi. I really use my database, but just um, so I'm I'm in in San Diego. 
the optimum is probably about 70, 30 purchase refi. You're going to do more refis than in other markets because people are going to overextend values going up. People are going to need to tap equity. I know that uh, when a lot of, if you talk to like companies in general, they like to see 80 to, 80 to you know, 90% purchase, but the loan amounts don't allow you, the lower loan amounts don't allow you to benefit from refinancing the way that they do in San Diego. Mm. But um, so my market, uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing two to three refinances a month currently with the rates being where they are, but you know, that's all database driven for the most part. Yes. Yeah, so do you, your purchase business, where does it come from? I do a lot of stuff. Well, um, most of the, uh, I'm in a, uh, I'm in a, a I'm in a, a business uh, networking group. I fact, we had a meeting this morning and I got two referrals from that. I'm uh, also, I do a lot of stuff on LinkedIn. Um, really, but the biggest source of my realtor referrals have come from the seller side. Because, you know, I go in, I talk with the seller's agent, I uh, really communicate uh, what, what, their, what my expectations for their hearing from me. And then I, you know, I, you know, I really make sure that they're communicated. And really, that's the key in that relationship is that so that the seller um, can always give tangible updates to their buyer. And it also like I don't know if you know this, Dan, but sometimes things go wrong in the in the during the process. But the thing is, is that if you have a line of communication and they know they can that you're honest, that right. they can trust you. Now, you know sometimes there's tap dancing. You know the uh, you know the the underwriter has to leave early because she has food poisoning, and so you're not going to get your approval until the you know. But at least they know. In, in the, it's not the first time they've heard of you, you know, four weeks down the transaction when they're expecting loan ducks. So I do uh, weekly updates and I found that a lot of my business has come from uh, the seller side wanting to uh, work with me as a result of that. And then I do a lot of net, um, networking through LinkedIn um, because the great thing is, is you can see what you have in common. Um, we I went to a LinkedIn training with uh, Brian Tracial who uh, is great. Um, I had hosted it when I was managing uh, for, uh, the first Cal mortgage, rest in peace. Um, and he said, uh, he, he showed us LinkedIn and he said, okay, um, we're gonna, I'm gonna put San Diego and I'm gonna put real estate agents. And I want three, he asked for just three random things to put in there. So uh, as a group, we came up with yoga, whiskey and blues. Mm -hmm. So he put that in and we found 16 real estate agents that had, that were into yoga, that were into whiskey and that like blues music. So what do you do with that? Well, you know, Hey Dan, um, I was on LinkedIn. You have a really interesting profile. And I noticed, Hey, you, uh, you like whiskey and you like the blues. Well, it just so happens in six weeks, I'm going to be, uh, I'm putting together like the whiskey tasting at the house of blues. Do you think that's something you'd be interested in coming to? Like that would be an example on how to use that. Now, um, I haven't hosted a whiskey tasting, but but that was okay, because um, when you're developing relationships, what was taught to me is that ideally, you want to deal with realtors that you would be friends with if you weren't doing business with, because you need to be able to speak truth to each other, and so you can do that with people that you you like, and so finding things that you have in common can break that down. Um, as a way of um, breaking in. Now, it can be the school you go to, whatever hobbies, but um, LinkedIn is great for being able to pre-qualify people. Am I going to get along with this person? Do we have anything in common? Um, do they, are they, uh, based on kind of their connections, are they working with agents, other loan officers? Who are they? Um, oh, they're working for that company. Oh, he must be, he's de definitely looking for a new loan officer if he's working with that, you know. That, that type of thing. How many, um, how many relationships have you developed off of LinkedIn? I have like 80 realtors. The pretty the, Well, I, I have over 9,500 contacts on LinkedIn, and, and I'm on there engaged a lot. Now, if you subtract recruiters, um, it's probably, a, you know, that, no, um, it's uh, <laughs> the majority is, um, you know, quite a bit. And so I'll, I'm on LinkedIn quite a bit. 
And I've built a lot of real estate um, relationships out of that. And also, um, not so much out of the area. I do a lot of loans out of the area, but what I what I do for that when I need an agent out of the area is I'll ask a local agent to refer that. So here's how that works. A lot of times um, I could easily, I do a lot of loans like in uh, Modesto and Stanislaus County. It's, it's just how it, it turns out. Um, I could easily find a realtor there, but I want to do more business in San Diego. So I'll contact a realtor that I want to do business with and say, Hey, you know, I re reviewed your profile. We haven't had the chance to work together. I'd love to. I don't have a buyer right now, but I have a buyer in um, Modesto. Um, if you could refer me that, uh, and the, you know, if you could refer me the Dan Trinidad of Modesto, I would greatly appreciate it. But I don't want to talk to him until you have a buy, uh, referral agreement set up. Now, obviously, you, you know, there's, you know, all this stuff about breaking bread, going deeper, and all that stuff's important. But to a realtor, um, if they're getting twenty five hundred bucks yeah. for a fifty minute, that's how you build rapport. And then the other thing is, is what I worked out when I started realizing doing that is that if I can give an agent three referrals a year, it's, it's equal to one extra transaction, and it's something that they're not necessarily getting. But also um, because the uh, the new Modesto realtor that I now have a relationship with knows that. They got this lead because I get referrals. Now they're now they're thinking, okay, um, well, you know, he's one of the few loan officers that gives referrals back, and he's really good at what he does, and he answers this phone call on the weekends, and um, you know, he'll he'll take a call on Sunday night and talk my client down from the cliff. Um, you know, I'm going to send him business. So, what's interesting to me is how focused you are on the experience of the customer. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Yet, you know, you're only doing a two or three refis a month right now. And, you know, and, and you, you, you kind of spoke to the motivation around there. But um, with rates dropping, I mean, aren't, aren't your phones like ringing off the hook right now? Yeah. And, but what, so, do you, and what do you do with that? So basically, on refis, I really... Um, from the 15th to the 30th is when I really try and look for refi business through my database. I mean, I'm always sending mailers and stuff like that, but literally I set up, um, when I set up like uh, previous client callback stuff on my uh, calendar and stuff, I always do it after the 15th. The reason is, is that I want to time my refinances to close before the 15th of the next month. So that my per if I'm going to need rushes on purchases or things like that at the end of the month, it's not being clogged up with refis. Plus, I want to keep my processing staff. Um, I want to try and keep it um, so they're not being slammed with a bunch of deals all at once. Um, I have a great process. I've never heard of that, Steve. That, I mean, I think that's the, this is the first I've ever heard of somebody consciously planning when they want their refis. It's brilliant. I mean, wow. Well, because I, uh, I, to a certain degree, I have a little bit of control on a refinance Sure. as far as that. And because most of the time I have all the data and things like that, but then also it keeps, um, you know, that it keeps my, uh, my loan officer assistant that last week of the month, you know, she's not following up on deals because my processor is doing that on purchases. So I have more business for her to go to. And then, you know, we set it up so that we're closing in the first half. That way also you're staggering, you're, 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 you should be getting consistent income, you know, paychecks and things like that. Yeah, very, very good. So give, give me a, a kind of a snapshot of your team. Okay, so I have a, a, a woman uh, by the name of Liz Bellany, who is a uh, loan officer assistant. Um, I, uh, when I, I'm not a big, I'm actually like um, a big believer in using uh, staff. I don't have my own staff that I carry with. Like I've got her because I joined the company and I wanted someone in the company because um, loan officers get acclimated to a degree that things are going to change. Things are not going to go the perfect one. Some, you know, you could have the 800 credit score, not need an appraisal, you know, not need any day one certainty all the way and something will come up. You, things get jinxed. And so 
a lot of, but a lot of times with operations, because they're so detailed um, focused, um, someone might be good in one system and they may not be good in another. So sometimes transitioning, if you're bringing a team over, the, it's been my uh, observation that the operations staff is always the toughest to acclimate. So I prefer to have someone who already knows where the bodies are buried, has relationships with underwriting, understands the system, and I use them to kind of uh, help me get acclimated. And Liz has been very, very good on that. I also, um, when I found out what she was getting on a per file deal, I offered her $50 more. And it's like, I'd rather pay you what you're worth rather than what you'll accept. And so that has helped my relationship with her as well, just because, um, you know, I, 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 I really believe that it's important to uh, develop, uh, you know, that not a, an adversarial relationship. You have to sometimes speak hard truth and advocate for your client. But I also think that um, advocacy, that, that charm goes a long way. On a, on a file, you're selling basically to two people or two entities. You're selling to the borrower who wants a house, wants money, whatever. And then you're selling to, to oper uh, underwriting. Now, underwriting wants the deal to go through. They understand that either, but you know, there's also necessary checks and balances and you need to respect that process. You know, their guidelines, not guide laws. It doesn't mean it, but it, it means that um, the, an adversarial negative relationship is not helpful yeah. and is uh, certainly that's, that's a, a mindset that I think is like leaving the industry. Thank goodness, you know, because um and so, but having someone who kind of knows the, who can tell me that, oh, you gotta, you know, you need to call the underwriter and this, and they can give, they could give me a hint on personality stuff. Oh, she likes Disney or uh, she likes, you know, she's a vegan. It, 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 it helps. And then my processor is a woman named Janine, who's very good. Um, temperament is really important with um, processing. I like, um, uh, sometimes uh, I would say that like there's a, there's a mindset that loan officers get coached on, you know, you're the quarterback, you tell the deal. I, to a degree that's, that's very important, but you know, in a system where the processor has been with the company and done 500 transactions and, you know, I've been a part of 200, if there's a, a deal that needs to be restructured, I'm not going to say, you know, you know, come down from the mountain and say, do it this way. I want to be a little bit more collaborative. Hey, how can we go? What have we done before? Learning things. And my first, uh, my first processor, um, that was a challenge for her. She was like, just fixed it. And I'm like, A, if you get me around in compass at a certain point, I, it's bull in China shot. I'm, I'm <laughs> like, I, but also like, um, you know, I feel that asking questions and kind of being collaborative, A, ex expands the, uh, collective intelligence of a group, but also it's, it's showing that I re respect what your knowledge and that I want to know from that. Absolutely. That was, so does your, does your, are you the only one that maintains contact with the, the, uh, the customer, the borrower? And no, I'll have, um, I'll have Liz reach out on needs lists and stuff like that because okay. a lot of times, you know, hey, I've, I reviewed your file. This is what we need. And we get there having another voice come in who can say, well, I reviewed the file and we need this. It actually gives an air of authority because it, um, uh, it lets them, you know, a lot of times I don't have this, but Liz is probably going to ask for this. And so if she, um, uh, when she asks for that, it solidifies, I know what I'm doing, but also, um, you know, having a, a different voice can be, it's, it's all in the setup. You know, I think there's a lot of conversations, though, um, that I'm not, I'm not going to outsource. And I probably, like, um, like, uh, you know, when I worked at Summit, we did, I did the core for 16 months. And I would probably say, based on how they taught it, I probably talked to my client more than most. I, I, you know, I outsource a lot less of that than a lot of other people. And I, but I think, you know, how can you ask for referrals and find opportunities? And also, you know, a um, operations staff isn't necessarily trained to hear 
for um, what my friend Chad Durfee refers to as the, the uplift. Um, a lot of times if you're looking for, uh, there's certain points in the transaction where you can ask for referrals and stuff like that. And if you're not in those conversations, you know, a, um, an LOA or a, isn't, or loan coordinator isn't going to necessarily hear that, but I'm going to. Yeah, absolutely. Now, do you have any loan officers reporting to you? I just hired one, um, uh, right now and she's been, been transitioning. Um, you know, she's, she's getting loans through it's, um, but I hadn't really built a team. I think part of it, um, when I came over here, it was, it's, it's taken a little bit, but I also wanted to know the system. I think sometimes you can, um, you need to know how the sausage is made so that you can, um, uh, make sure that you're, it's a privilege when people want to come work for you. So you yeah. want to make sure that's as good a situation. People have plenty of choices, not all good, but you know, they're out there and it's a privilege when people want to come and work for you. And, and it's not to say that, you know, that there's bad companies, but um, you know, and I would say this to people that I mentor is that um, the best company isn't necessarily the best company for you. You know, uh, you only get one if you if you change companies. You only get one chance to choose your boss. Um, don't go for guarantee. Don't go for um, you know money and stuff. You want to choose opportunity. You want to go after leadership. And you know those are you know people hear different voices. You know th different voices resonate differently. Just like um, you know uh, I used to mentor um, for uh, for. for Three years, I uh, mentored at my church a middle school worship band. So basically, you had girls and you had boys. Now, it was a real challenge for me because if something wasn't right, um, it's easy. A lot of boys going through Little League here, dude, <laughs> that's, that sucks. And they don't get defensive on it because they've soccer, they've heard that. But when you're dealing with you know middle school girls, it, they're not necessarily – used to that gruff. And then also the church I was going to, a lot of the, uh, the kids I was mentoring didn't have the dads, either dads in their life or the parents that they deserved. So even just, I, I might've been the only man in their life that was uh, regularly there. And so even how to communicate to that. And so, but what that taught me was patience, but also not everyone hears what you think they're hearing. So like, um, you know, they would go through a song and, you know, I, I can sometimes have kind of a, 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 a look it's just because I'm zoning out and I'm listening and it's not anything intentional, but it turned out it was kind of intimidating to a couple of the girls who were kind of offset, like, like I did something wrong and it wasn't even anything there. So I started turning my back when they would do it. I just, I don't want you to see any reaction. Now, um, that, um, I can't tell you how much uh, being, a, I learned about leadership and managing personalities and stuff because of that. Like if you wow. can manage middle school girls, you can manage anybody because you're dealing with egos, personalities, um, self-esteem, um, you know, and, and, you know, they all still talk to me five, six years after the fact. So I view that as a win. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely a testament to your, to your uh, coaching. Or so my patience. Or your patience. So you've been through, uh, obviously, market fluctuations over the last 23 years. Tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, how you overcome these roadblocks or any types of setbacks along the way. Maybe, maybe your uh, perception of them and um, if there's any specific actions you take around them? Well, I think it's, um, I think that's a good question. I think um, a lot of it is, it's important. Um, I, a lot of, it's important to kind of understand the world that you're in. And so uh, I think a lot of loan officers um, don't read enough about, business or even understanding, you know, how secondary prices a rate sheet and where rates come from. You know, it's always been my pet peeve when people will, you know, 10-year uh, bond. And I understand 10-year bond is a, it's not the indicator of how your mortgage is priced. 
it's an indicator of, you know, because it's a benchmark that's influential, but it's not the be all and end all. But a lot of loan officers have no understanding of that. I think that um, you know, needs, you know, you know, I've always wanted to learn more and I've always envy people who didn't give a shit because, you know, I'm someone that, you know, at five o'clock on Sunday when the Japanese markets open up in the futures market, like I'm looking at it and like, oh, you know. Really? <laughs> I love that. I, I love that stuff. I, I don't think you'd want me running your hedge fund, but I just, I, I love that type of stuff. And I love how all the pieces seem to go. But, you know, I was always someone that was willing to um, learn and adapt. Um, you know, you know, it's just like when the, uh, you know, when the business, um, you know, went from 125s and those, those loans to, you know, I did go into first mortgages, you know, I had to, to learn. A lot. I took a, a bunch of rate sheets and, and uh, guideline sheets, you know, home and basically for 48 hours, just crammed on everything so I could learn everything about that. Um, I think, uh, you know, I think you need to uh, really understand your industry, but also um, don't like, you know, in good times and bad times, I have a weekly newsletter that goes out. It's a pretty good letter. Um, the, a lot of it is, uh, I subscribe to it, but I always put in a paragraph, an intro that indicates that I know what's in, you know, that, that I understand what this topic is and all of that. And 15 years without fail, good times, bad times, um, I have sent that out. And, you know, I think consistency with anything with habit is how you, you get through that. And also having a, a long enough of a memory that this too shall pass. Um, you know, a lot of times if you look at like bond traders, you're like, what, what are you selling for? Um, you know, but, you know, a lot of bond traders are 23-year-old guys without a lot of history and not understanding that, yeah. you know, uh, just because people are making – you know, a dollar more, you know, on the low end of the scale doesn't mean we're going to have rampant inflation on there. Um, you know, it's, it's, sometimes you just have to have a little bit of perspective and you also have to have patience and be able to explain things to people so that they, uh, that they trust you and also be adaptable and see, I love it. you know, cause, um, I think sometimes people will be, you know, where I haven't adapted is like, I have no desire to do um, reverse mortgages. I'm getting at the age where I could probably sell those. I mean, I'm not too far from being like known as the silver fox and all that stuff. I'm 54, <laughs> but I don't like products where I have to call somebody before I can call you back, right? mm -hmm. you know, which is why I don't do commercial. Now, I think that makes me more of an expert because I have people I can refer for those types of transactions who are experts. But I think um, you can solidify uh, you can solidify how a borrower or a, a referral contact thinks of you by your willingness to say no, and and the eagerness in which you're willing to say no. Yeah. Wow. Well, good. Thank you. So you you gave us a clue that you're up early. Um, you, you indicated before that you work about twelve hours a day. Give well, us but but there's breaks in there. I um. It's just I like working. I like going to the office. Right. Give me a picture of give me a picture of your day. Like what time does it start? Do you have a morning routine? Five thirty. Um, if things if you're not in a refi where uh, refi opportunity, I'll I'll go to the gym for you know uh, you can't tell, but I'll go to the gym for like an hour or so, and then I will um, uh, go into the office usually by seven o'clock, six thirty seven. Um, and I'll just be in my database for about an hour, um, hour. So I, I go through, um, in my database, I go through about 50 names a day to see if they've been opening my campaigns. Um, you know, if there's things I need to update, if there's opportunities for me to call, I also get through my database for, uh, real estate and referral partners that I haven't, um, you know, to make sure that I'm staying in touch with them and making sure that all my, uh, email stuff is up to date. Then um, around 8.30, uh, I'll, I'll start making outbound calls depending on the area to kind of follow up. 
um, I keep a, I, I write a list by hand every night before I leave on stuff that I need to go through. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, by hand, I think it's because I have to think about it. I could type it, you know, but I think by having it on hand, it, um, it, it solidifies it for me. And then um, usually by 8.30, I will send an email to my uh, loan coordinator on deals that I need to be priority. I don't give her every deal that I have, but I, I do a pri priority on stuff that I can do. And that's, that's usually five or six. And if there's stuff, you know, other stuff, I'll go through it. Like, you know, I'm not a, I'm not someone, I'll follow up if I know I need something like that. So from about 8.30 to uh, 10.30, I'll be working on kind of new files, stuff like that. And then um, usually I'll set my, uh, I'll try and do one to two in-person appointments a day. Um, I pick an occupation each month that I'm going to concentrate on so that I can learn as much about it. So like uh, I'm meeting a lot with uh, financial and tax professionals this month. And that's because I'm on focus and then I can think a lot about um, people that I can do that. So, you, so on, you pick an occupation, you schedule appointments with them and you, you try to have one or two a day. Are those typically in the afternoons? I usually like to do it like 11 to 12 or like two to three. Um, just because a lot of like, uh, my work stuff, like, you know, it seems like a lot of conditions and stuff come in between that 12 and two. Yeah. So if there's, th I, I kind of want to leave time on that. And then, um, usually I'll be out the door by around, uh, four 30, but, um, you know, I'll be taking calls at night and on my way home, I'll be calling, uh, realtors. And a lot of times I'll just call guys from other companies because I love to talk shop about, you know, what's going on with rates or what they're seeing and things like that. Yeah, that's great. So, so do you typically meet at the same spot or do you meet it? I have a really awesome office. So people will come, it's in a great location. It's okay. got a really good view deck. And so, and since I'll uh, cover their party, I can usually get people down at my office um, or I'll do something. I'm in downtown San Diego. So, you know, I'll, I'll meet off site if, if, needed but um yeah, downtown san diego is pretty nice i well i'm right my uh my building overlooks the ballpark oh does it so you can actually watch i've had appointments uh, you know, one of my number one realtors you know came and i didn't know she was a base big baseball fan but we have a balcony right outside uh there and we we watch the game while seriously yeah. oh wow okay i'll have to get down there when the when the giants are in town yeah, absolutely. I would like that. Um, it's a good ballpark. Yeah, very. It'd be, nice. it'd be fun to take a game with you. Great. But it's even better when it's free. There's something, you know, there's something visceral about freedom. You know, a free baseball game. You know. It's, yeah. No. No question. It's like it, Give me some ideas of some occupations that you you focus on. So, financial planners, tax attorneys. Um, you know, uh, so I'm in a, a, a networking group. I think. Um, uh, you know, obviously you do financial planners, you do uh, insurance people, but it's important to, um, it's important to meet with people who, you know, real estate agents, obviously, um, but it's important, you know, when you're referring, I always, that's one reason why I use LinkedIn, that if I'm meeting with someone, I want to go in with the game plan of who I'm going to refer them to. Like once I meet, I always go in with a couple, oh, this is someone that would be a good fit for you. Like I had a financial planner whose specialty was setting up doctors. Um, he worked with doctors in financial planning. So I went in there and I said, oh, a good, you know, um, a good mutual friend of ours is uh, head of the, uh, the Grossmont Hospital District. And, you know, I'm pretty good friends. And we go, you, me and him go to the same church. Why don't, um, I think, uh, let me set something up so that uh, I can introduce you when you guys are both at church. Well, that was a huge one for him because that uh, happens to be the biggest employer in the city that I live in. And he had no clue that the guy went to church. And it was also, uh, yeah. we had a good enough relationship. So, but then also, um, uh, oh, hey, do you have much business in, um, you know, the Palm Springs area? He said, we're trying to do that. I said, oh, well, my father-in-law works for Palm Springs Life. And every year they do a special health care edition that gets sent to all these people and stuff like that. 
he, I said, he, you know, he would be worth the conversation because he would be able to tell you everything, you know, and, and that conversation went really well. Um, but I, I, so I'll go, that's an example, but I'll always go in with like one to two people. Hey, I'm going to introduce you to this person and this is why. And then I have a really good um, handoff skill. that I'll do. Such a great skill to have. I, I love that plan. Well, see, the thing is, it's like, I'm not like, I'm very comfortable being on stage or with people, but like, if you were to have, like most people, if you were to have me go to like a thousand person room and have to go in and kind of work the room it wouldn't be my highest and best use my wife however is very is very good but i'm a really i would be considered a really good networker and i so i started like asking about this like you know i'm kind of an introvert but i'm a good networker and so i actually did harvard business school has done studies on this and that Introverts make better networkers, A, because they listen to more. The loud guy in the elevator, not a good networker um, because he doesn't listen. Um, I'm actually a very good networker because I'm a good connector um, as far as, saying, okay, this person would be good because of that. And I give a reason why I'm introducing them. Um, not beyond, like, he's going to give you a great, but common interests, things like that. So it's a really strong hand. And, and, Part of that is, um, you know, I have a good sense of people because one of the biggest mistakes, and I tell this to realtors all the time, and if you have listened, is that, uh, it, and, and tell me if this has happened to you, you do a great job on a purchase transaction with a realtor that this is your first time with them. And they say, Dan, you're great. I'm going to put you in my list of three real estate agents that I'm going to refer. So an agent told me this and I said, I was kind of exasperated because I had moved mountains to get this loan through. Like literally it was the hand of God and I, and that got the loan through. And to be honest, let's be honest, nobody who works on commission is an atheist because you're like, Lord, please. Fund this loan. <laughs> but um, so we're working it, but um, he's like, I'm going to put, and I said, I, you know, I'd rather not. And he's like, you know, and this was a pretty good agent. Why? And I said, when people ask you for a referral, they're looking at you as a great real estate agent and you're basically, they're asking you to curate that, like give them somebody. And so you, I said, in my opinion, you really miss an opportunity because I don't have to be your, re, your loan officer for all transactions, but there's some that I'm a better fit than others. And there may be some where you need a Spanish speaking loan officer and stuff like that, but they're coming to you because you should know good realtors. So when you just outsource it and give them three, you know, everyone's every loan officer is going to want to do business with you and they're going to be all over for that client first time buyer like a hobo and a ham sandwich and the buyer will not go looking because they'll be like overwhelmed i got three loan officers calling me in 30 seconds i said you're better off being a curator and saying i work with a ton of people but i thought about it and i i want dan because he's you you know mentioned that you're self-employed um, that you are in this business and Dan's done a lot of, you know, people for this type of, class. like I have a little niche of doing pastor loans. A lot of people don't understand just how to do pastoral income. I've learned how to do it and it's, um, I've done it successfully. And, you know, literally that's a, a strong niche for me. I become like the, the go-to God guy, but um, as a result, yeah. exactly. But one of the, uh, so one of the realtors um, that, you know, so I, I'm doing a loan for a pastor right now and they had their own real estate agent. We talked and this weekend she sent me two VA Jumbo deals. A, because I take the calls. But the, the thing is, is that she also knew that like her clients would like me, like it would be a good fit. And so I think that the, and I would tell real estate agents is curate your files. You don't have to refer everyone to the same person. In fact, it's, better if you don't, but understand your clients enough and understand who the available loan officers are so that you're giving them a choice that will make the buyers want to go shopping, you know, not overwhelm them. Yeah, that's, that's very, very good advice, Dave. Um, so our, we're running out of time here and I'd like to just get your take on the future of, of our industry. Well, I think, um, I think we're still going to get good. It's, it, it's interesting. I think, um, you know, 
I think we need to start thinking in terms of community. Um, you know, the, the largest home buying sector is uh, second generation um, immigrants. Um, so I think uh, obviously if you don't speak other languages, recruit people that speak other languages. Um, I think our industry needs to find a way that we can um, encourage uh, people who are successful selling other things to come into the industry and to uh, um, create disincentives for people that don't honor our industry to be moved out. Um, I think rates are still going to be, be good. I think the, 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 the weeding that is the, the, the weeding out that took place, you know, with the margin compression has left people, the ones that are still standing are busy enough. Um, you know, there's still opportunities. Um, and now you have, uh, you know, uh, you still have a, you have a lot of pent up demand, you know, mm -hmm. because you have, uh, you, you're, you're going on 12 years where all the people that wanted to buy homes, you haven't been able to, you know, I think, uh, you know, we still need to work through inventory. Um, but, you know, uh, we might see a recession economically, but it's not going to be housing focused. And this time around housing, if we come out of it, it'll be housing that kind of brings the economy back. I think, um, you know, the quality of loans that we've written because of the legislations and stuff in place has been really good. So we're not going to see that kind of meltdown. Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, I think. Um, so if you're, if you're 19 year old son, wanted to get in the mortgage business, what, what advice would you give them? Would, would you encourage it? Would you say, uh, son, there's, there's better avenues? Um, you know, I wouldn't discourage. Actually, um, uh, he has a friend that I've known since he was sixth grade, and that kid has loan officer written all over him. And I've actually, like said, you know, um, come and just spend – you know, like three hours, just kind of watching it. Like, um, I think, I think you could do this. Um, with my, I wouldn't discourage him on that. I think, um, uh, I think sometimes it's, it's hard because people don't see the victories. You know, sometimes a lot of the times the loan officer isn't the one giving the keys. Uh, the, you know, the loan officer is kind of the, uh, kind of the right, the left guard. You know we're uh, you know we're carrying we're we're pushing a lot of weight, but the uh, the realtor is the quarterback and they kind of get all the glory, and I like that. It's a lunch pail profession, um, which I I like. You know I've always felt like there's two professions where you know you uh, we're being too good looking is kind of a uh, distraction. I think loan officer and uh, comedian obviously because you need to. Um, with a loan officer, you don't want to be distracting when people are signing their disclosures because, like, <laughs> um, they'll date it wrong. But um, you know, obviously, with uh, um, comedians, you know, you need to. You, if you're really good looking, you're not going to have the kind of pain that makes something really funny. But um, I think that you know, I've always looked at being a loan, kind of a lunch pail profession. Like it was never about glamour. I think. Um, you know, I think uh, being a realtor, it's aspirational, but loan officer, it's it's in the trenches. You still have to know the same calls the quarterback has. You have to know their job really well, but, um, you know, it, a lot of it's you're just pushing things out of the way. You got to be okay not getting the glory. Just oh, I prefer me. that. That's funny. Um, so, Steve, how do people get a hold of you? Well, uh you can uh, call me at 619-895-8128. That's uh, my number. Um, if you go to citywide.com forward slash Stephen Moy, uh, that's my uh, website. And then, um, you know, uh, those are the best ways to get a hold of me. That's great. Steve, I look forward to getting to know you even better. I really- Well, we gotta do a game. If you're gonna come down. I'm all for it. I, I, I'm in San Diego fairly frequently, so. In fact, I should be there a couple times over the next month. So I'll definitely yeah, it's, get it's such a lousy place to visit. Uh, yeah, I know. Every, every time I go down there, it seems to rain, but um, I know that's not the case. So, Steve, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it, and we've learned a lot from you today. And I, 
like I said, I look forward to, to talking to you again soon. It's nice to talk to the legend finally. So that's yeah. kind of like, it's sort of like being asked to sit on Johnny Carson's, you know, <laughs> couch. Oh boy, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Have a great. I'm day. dating myself, but that's yeah, it's, it's it's an honor, you know. Dating both of us, I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you. We'll see you bye soon. Bye. Bye.